South Korea has stolen Chinese culture, according to China. Let me show you what I mean. What does everything here share in common? According to the Chinese internet, it's cultural appropriation. Not Chinese people stealing Korean culture, but Korean people stealing Chinese culture. How can the literal Korean national flag be Chinese, you might ask? It's because the design consists of a yin-yang and eight trigrams from Chinese Taoism. Notice the title of the article says, Thief Nation is no joke? It turns out this word Thief Nation is a popular popular nickname for Korea on Baidu, which is China's version of Google. Google's blocked in China, so China has its own search engine called Baidu that people in China use daily. When I look up who does Thief Nation refer to, lo and behold, Baidu itself straight up says South Korea. Oh, but it gets even better. Baidu has even curated a list of the top 20 things Korea robbed from China, including food, clothing, holidays, sports, religion, art, everyday technology. Do millions of Chinese people just think Korea doesn't deserve to be its own country? But I think the bigger and more interesting question is, why is this happening? Say hello to Gen N. China's hyper-nationalistic Gen Zs. A lot of foreign policy observers blame this group for trying to cancel Korean culture. But here's what doesn't add up. Why aren't they picking on Japan too then? Nani? Like they don't refer to Japan as thief nation, even though arguably Japan has taken even more credit than Korea for things of Chinese origin. I mean, hey, I'm of Japanese descent, but I'm not gonna go around pretending that, say, the kimono I grew up wearing on special occasions wasn't derived from Chinese Wu Dynasty garments, or till about a hundred years ago, was actually called gofu, meaning clothing of the Wu Dynasty. So then why on Instagram, for example, are thousands of Chinese users lashing out at Korean celebrities for posing in hanbok, which is a traditional Korean outfit, when there's been zero reported backlash against Japanese people for wearing kimonos? So I dug through hundreds of Chinese and Korean language articles, and here's what I've observed from both the Chinese and Korean side of things. What I'm about to share is so absurd, it might honestly beat Squid Game at its own game. Within a month of the show airing, Korean political activist So Young Dog circulated on Instagram a screenshot from a Chinese shopping app of what he claimed are knockoffs of Squid Game merch. That's definitely accurate for the outfit on the right, which is clearly a Squid Game reference since it's a famous scene from the show. But what stirred the pot is the photo on the left, where the outfit looks basically identical, but has the word China printed on it in big white text. Yeah, that looks pretty bad. <laughs> so Gyeong Dok uses this as ammo to pop off that Chinese people are not only illegally profiting off of the K-drama, but appropriating and claiming Korean culture as their own. Mic drop! And bam, this went viral in Korea. Major news organizations like Choson Ilbo, which is basically the New York Times of Korea, published multiple different articles about it. But then the Chinese media caught wind of it and... Uh -oh. Turns out that China gym suit wasn't Squid Game merch at all, but merch for a Chinese movie called Song of Youth that came out in 2019, so two years before Squid Game. Wait, what? So the photo was actually a scene from Song of Youth, and the guy pictured in it isn't just some rando, but Wu Jing, who's basically the Brad Pitt of China, like literally the highest grossing Chinese actor of all time. And he wore that gym suit to the global premiere of another film he was in that coincidentally came out in the same month the Squid Game. And that sparked a wave of Chinese memes and renewed interest in Song of Youth, hence the merch on the Chinese shopping app. So this time the Chinese internet pops off like, hey Korea, we clearly came up with this outfit first, so if anything, you stole from us. In fact, one of the top 50 most watched videos of all time on Billy Billy, aka Chinese YouTube, FYI, YouTube is also banned in China, is a video essay that points out how the tracksuit in the movie is actually a cultural reference to what Chinese Olympian Xu Haifeng wore when he won China's very first Olympic gold medal in 1984. Okay, okay, so are we concluding that Koreans are the ones at fault here? I think the answer is actually quite nuanced. Let me break down exactly what I mean into two parts. <laughs> Considering the Insta post that instigated all of this was deleted, a lot of Koreans probably realize now, like, hey, maybe we jumped the gun there. So from a Chinese perspective, it's easy to be like, hey, the Koreans are at it again with their exclusionary nationalism, which is a term a Korean publication came up with, interestingly, to describe how Korea has recently been trying to monopolize 
things that East Asia as a collective region shares in common. This gets back to the original question of why China chooses to beef with Korea instead of Japan over cultural identifiers like food, clothing, etc. Because Japan isn't quite as extreme about claiming exclusive ownership of East Asian cultural traditions. One obvious example of this was when a Korean government agency known as the Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism declared in an official statement that Chinese people are brazenly opening Korean restaurants in Europe right now to exploit the Korean wave and undermine the dignity of Korean cuisine. They said this without providing any concrete data or evidence, by the way. It was just projecting an opinion. I mean, by that logic, shouldn't all the sushi restaurants operated by Koreans, which is most sushi restaurants outside of Japan, close their businesses because they're selling another country's food? I think it's pretty wild that this kind of sentiment could make its way into a government statement. But what about the second part of this whole equation? Bringing Japan back into the analogy, one thing Japan doesn't have to really worry about, but Korea does, is North Korea. Not just on a geopolitical level, in terms of China being besties with North Korea, which Korea is literally in a war with as we speak, but on a cultural identity level, because China loves to play up the fact that Koreans in China, quite a few of whom live in provinces bordering North Korea, are actually recognized as one of China's 56 official ethnic groups. From a Korean perspective, referring here to people from South Korea, China constantly weaponizes this Korean minority group to sort of invalidate Korean national identity. One famous example of this was the Hamburg scandal of the 2022 Beijing Olympics where China had representatives from each of its 56 ethnic groups take part in the opening ceremony wearing their respective group's traditional clothing, and one of the participants was a woman from the Korean minority group in China wearing a Hamburg. This sparked a huge outrage, not just online, but in diplomatic relations between the Korean and Chinese governments, with Korea arguing that China was treating the woman as Chinese and using her to appropriate Korean culture, and China insisting that this was a show of respect for Korean cultural traditions and the unique identities of China's minority groups. Here's where the plot really thickens. Hanbok was actually featured in the exact same way 14 years earlier at the 2008 Beijing Olympics, but there was no backlash from Korea at the time. What changed? <laughs> Definitely one change is the Korean wave or Hallyu of the past decade where Korean historical dramas and K-pop stars wearing designer hanbok on stage turned the outfit into a kind of cultural status symbol. And so hanbok and by extension other traditional Korean things like kimchi that are now trendy have become synonymous with Korean soft power and cultural capital. So I can understand even just practically or economically speaking how it can feel pretty tone deaf for China to contest the Koreanness of these things when the whole reason the world outside of Asia knows about them now is thanks to Korea's cultural popularity. So did Korea appropriate Chinese culture? I would say it's like this. Blackberry invented the world's first smartphone. Apple invented the world's sexiest smartphone. Did Apple steal from Blackberry just because the iPhone was an adaptation of the basic prototype Blackberry came up with? I mean, technology's always evolved and I think is meant to always evolve. So good luck with that lawsuit. But should the world be giving BlackBerry more credit than it's been getting for being the reason we have smartphones in the first place? So this gets to my very final point, which is that I think a lot of Chinese angst towards Korean culture is the byproduct of a bigger picture issue where Westerners consider China way less cool than Korea, despite their cultural overlap. I'm sure it's already really annoying for so many Chinese people to see Americans infatuated with Japan without having any clue that a lot of the things they like about Japanese culture, like matcha or ramen, originally came from China. And now to see Koreans taking the spotlight for things like jajangmyeon, which has almost 7 million search results, versus the original Chinese dish, jajangmyeon, which has less than a tenth of the search results. Like sure, China could do a better job at marketing itself internationally, but I think there's also a lot of willful ignorance that comes from people letting geopolitics kill any deeper curiosity about Chinese culture. But it shouldn't have to be political to acknowledge China's not-so-minor 
historical role in shaping these other cultures we now enjoy. Especially when you consider China itself has multiple countries worth of cuisines, natural habitats, and climates. As you can probably tell by now, the point of this video is not to roast Koreans or Chinese people, but to confront certain assumptions we make or don't make about East Asia. It might seem like people in China live in a bubble just because they don't have legal access to Google, YouTube, Instagram, etc. But at least they know these platforms exist in the first place. Whereas how many people in America, for example, even realize that there's this whole Chinese internet universe serving 1.4 billion people? Who's really living in a bubble? 